everyone and welcome back. Today I am I want to talk more about eating disorders as it is eating disorder awareness week. So I wanted to make a video um while it was still awareness week and you know to bring more awareness and to talk more about it. So we'll get right in. So just a quick overview. Um I have talked about this on my channel before. Um I can always link the video down below if you want to have more of a um more of a kind of insight into things um, and just kind of see what I talked about in the first ever video that I made where I talked about it. Um, so as a lot of you know, if you're new here you might not have known, um, I suffered with anorexia for five or six years. Um, sorry, I was just trying to think back. Um, and it all started because um, I got heavily bullied throughout school, um, a bit in primary school, a lot in high school, I couldn't even finish high school um, and because there was a lot of targeted bullying to me about my looks, um, you know it was always like you're spotty, you're like someone did tell me that I was fat and um, honestly looking back I was never fat um, but we'll get more into that um, so you know like I was bullied a lot and obviously when you get bullied relentlessly and it follows you home as well because then that was around about the time when like Ask FM was like a thing and like people would tell me to go drink bleach that I should deserve to die, um, a lot of really really horrible things and it was very clear that um, looking back that I did suffer from depression for quite a while before I realised I had depression. Um, I would come home every night from school, I would cl like, close my doors, like I'd just fall, like, collapse on the floor, bursting into tears because I absolutely hated every second of being at school but at the same time I knew that I couldn't miss out on it because I knew that my education was important so, so even though school was a place of where all the bullying was happening it was also a place where I could communicate and socialise with friends which I didn't do when I was at home because I would isolate myself a lot um, I was definitely very very depressed um, which then in turn became I like obviously when you're depressed if you already have depression you know like you kind of don't really have an appetite you don't really have any motivation for things and it started off with me just not feeling hungry and just not really wanting to like just not feeling like I needed to eat um, but then because everything felt very out of control I then kind of just was like, okay, well, I can control what I eat. I can control um, exercising, blah, blah, blah. Like, I can control these things. And, like, I didn't, like, fully consciously start off like that. It just, I don't even really remember, like, the full point of when it all kind of started, really. Um, all I just remember is that I just was really depressed and then... It just started to become becoming a cycle of where I just would um, not eat or would just like restrict um, the calories that I was eating. And I, because it's Awareness Week, I just want to put like a possible trigger warning on this video. And um, I don't think I'll say anything that's triggering, but just in case. Um, and because it's Awareness Week, I don't really want to just beat around the bush. I just want to really like give people the information about like eating disorders you know um but I also want to just put it there just in case um because I know that when I was unwell um even though I would see a potential trigger warning I would still read it and then I'd get upset that I'd then been triggered but you know I'd done it to myself anyway um but anyway so it just be then became a cycle of that um but then it also got to a point where it um, 
like it always started off as control for me because I couldn't really control anything else in my life so it was definitely from a control for food for me and um, but then it got to a point where the eating disorder kind of became a bit stronger than me because I was very vulnerable and very insecure um, from all the bullying so it kind of took over and then that led to me you know making myself sick as well as all these other things um, which in a combination is not very good it's not good at all so um, I then remember the bullying was just getting like way too much and I was just getting like I just was really done with it all and I actually sent a text to my mum um, and I was like, you know, I just, I can't do this anymore. Um, so obviously my mum just came in, like she came to the school and took me out and I got treat, I got referred, like my mum took me to the doctors about it um, and we got assessed by CAMS. Um, because at first they were like, you know, it's going to probably take a couple, of, like quite a while because like there's a waiting list and my mum was like, okay. But after they kind of did some tests and what they do is they, obviously they weigh you, they take your height, they check your standing and rest and heart rate and your pulse. Um, and then they ask you to do like physical things like can you lift your arm and can you like sit up? Can you like lift your legs like when you're sitting and lying down? just to see like how your joints are going and stuff like that um, and then after they had assessed me they um, basically were very concerned they had said that you know we will we're kind of concerned about Megan so we're going to refer her to a psychologist and within a week I had an appointment and I got then got referred to a day centre which was called Willow Grove and I was there for a couple of days, about, or a week. I literally didn't talk to anyone. Like, I was such an isolated ball. Like, I just wouldn't speak. I just, like, was so consumed by this illness that I just, now I, you can't shut me up now, which is a bit of a lot of progress. Um, I was just so consumed by this illness, I didn't really talk to anyone. Kind of just was very closed off. Um, I didn't really want people to help me because in my head I didn't see a problem um, so I was there for about a week or a couple like about four days because um, it was like near the end of July um, in 2013 and I after that you know like because what they do is you know you get a meal plan and they obviously just increase your food intake slightly at the start um, and they would give you like meal times and stuff where they would sit with you and they would encourage you to like drink and to eat and stuff um, and it just wasn't happening so they obviously they do like once they do that they have like a weekly thing or depending on how ill they class you they and I say that because um, there is a lot of stereotypes around eating disorders which I'll get into in a minute because I don't want to keep getting sidetracked and lose where I am because I'm very bad for that um so like they took me up to get weighed and to do my obs like in observations is when they do like your pulse and your resting and standing heart rate um and they were like they weighed me and they were very happy but they also took my blood pressure and my blood pressure was very low but my heart rate was very high so they were like okay well you need to go to accident emergency um, and they took my blood and they did the pulse the pulse and the blood pressure and they were very concerned about my heart rate because it was like really very very low but my pulse was like really high or something like that and I had to stay in overnight um, and then after that they then decided to refer me to an inpatient centre um, in Edinburgh and oh it was not very nice because obviously I was very not talking to, I was just very quiet I just didn't talk to anyone didn't see that I had a problem and um, got into the inpatient hospital and it was very difficult um, so we were there and 
obviously the illness was very difficult and it had a very hard grip on me and obviously I didn't engage in the recovery process for quite a few days and they basically phoned up my parents and was like just to let you know um, we're gonna have to give Megan a feeding tube which was called an I'm sure it's called an NG tube um, we're gonna ask her for her permission and if she doesn't agree with it we're gonna have to section her and she's gonna have to get it that was how severe the situation was obviously at this point I did not see how severe the situation was um, in my head I was like you know these people are overreacting like what's their deal I just want to go home um, but that was also the illness trying to convince me that you know I wasn't sick enough you know like I should just be at home like I shouldn't be here um, but actually in all reality I was extremely unwell like I really had to be there um, so they explained to me the situation they were like you know if you don't agree to this we'll have to section you and I was like shit <laughs> like oh I don't want that to happen because when they section you it depends on how you comply it can mean that you'll be there for a lot longer and um, just depending on how you follow the recovery plan if you don't follow the recovery the, the recovery plan very well um you are there for a longer period of time um because i know that there was a girl there um that was so lovely she had been there for quite a few years um and i knew that i just didn't want to be there for a long period of time so i agreed to it voluntarily because i was like i you know i just i can't be sectioned like i just can't and also in my head I was like, I'm not sick enough to be sectioned. Um, and so obviously I agreed to it. The most painful thing I've ever had, even sort of than like tattoos, like it was horrible because it like goes through your nose and like in. Um, and I would get like a liquid feed like every so often. But then as I was kind of getting this, I kind of got to a point where I was like, you know what I just want it out and I kept asking can I like can I get it out please like can I get it out like can I go and eat things they didn't obviously believe me because when someone's like not in like a safe place like in themselves like with an eating disorder they don't tend to believe you until you kind of show that you're going to commit to the recovery plan so I had to keep the tube in and try and eat food which was very difficult because you have this like tube in and you're trying to eat at the same time um so there was that um, and they agreed eventually to take it out which was a very like it was, it was such a really it just was uncomfortable you know like it would always like fall out of the plaster and it would just like get everywhere and I couldn't sleep because it was like uncomfortable but but in a, in a sense it did motivate me to want to get better more um, so I was there for two months and I got home um, to say the transition from obviously like when you're an inpatient they obviously give you trials to go home just to see how you deal with it I struggled a lot with being at home because being at home was a very like triggering place for me not gonna lie it still kind of is um, not like eating disorder way just like in mental health ways it just has a big massive like dark clouds that just like sometimes clouds me sometimes and I'm like oh but like that's okay like I'm working on that like that's fine um, but I struggled a lot because it was very um, you know like you got so used to somewhere else um, and then you had to go back to that kind of negative environment which I very I, I struggled with a lot um, I got a home team that came out and they would just double check how I was doing see how everything was going on and like things would be going okay for a while and then things just like dropped and then they would kind of be a bit up and down like I'd be doing okay then not okay and then it was just a bit vicious thing and then I got another house worker because she changed sections um, and eventually I ended up back in Willow Grove. Um, I managed to stay at home for about maybe a year or less um, and ended up back in Willow Grove. Um, it, it's a very difficult process because see when it becomes it, like it was weird for me because obviously it started off as control but if it, at some point along those lines it did become about weight um, and I don't know why it did um, 
but it was very like, you know, I just feel horrible and just oh, like disgusting and stuff like that. And when you kind of go from like zero or like you're restricting or whatever, um, and they like slowly progress, like you then have to eat like six meals a day, I'm sure it was. Like you should breakfast, morning snack, lunch, afternoon snack, dinner and supper. Yeah, so you went from like a very small amount to then having six meals a day, um, which is mind blowing. Um, so yeah, I ended up back in Willow Grove and I was in Willow Grove for a really long time after that. Basically until I was 18, I was in Willow Grove. Um, I never ended up back in the inpatient unit for my eating disorder. I did end up going back because I tried to take my own life. Um, but they were very helpful and, you know, it's not happened since then. So, like, it's, it's all good. Um, but, yeah, so, like, recovery isn't very one straight line. It's very, like, all over the place. Um, and I want to, because to, I know that people will get annoyed that I said this, but... I wanted to just say what I had to say and then come to this point. You know, when someone else says you're not sick enough, that stereotype holds a lot of negative for a lot of people. Yes, me as a person had that own mindset, which is damaging as well. But there's so many stereotypes that affect so many people um, from reaching out to get help. Um, you know, like people who are, you know, like, cause the thing is people go off of BMI and BMI is still very inaccurate because they don't take into consideration a lot of different things, especially if you're a woman and you have like boobs and then you have like other organs that, you know, like you have like a womb and like all that sort of stuff, like, and they're like heavy in their own way, you know what I mean? So it's like, they don't take into consideration all these other things and it's not okay and a lot of professionals will be like well you don't reach this BMI so we cannot refer you and that really annoys me because it's like no this person still deserves help like why are you not helping them and it's just like it's such a stereotype that really stops people from getting help like if someone is showing signs of having an eating disorder you give them the help like what is so hard to understand about that like I so understand they're so underfunded the NHS but especially for mental health but if someone is actively restricting what they eat or like binging or purging or over exercising or like they are being too healthy and it's like becoming a very serious problem or you know like the eating disorders that never get spoken about like all the eating disorders like if they are showing signs of this and it's becoming a part of their it's becoming a problem for them as a part of their life why do they not deserve help before it's too late you do not under any circumstances have to be extremely underweight like medically underweight to deserve help that just is ridiculous to me you know, like I read a story about a girl on the Beat website, which is a eating disorder charity, and um, that she wasn't medically underweight for her height, um, but she managed to get help and she managed to get out of her recovery process in nine months' time. You know, like I think early intervention is so important. It shouldn't get to the point where someone is extremely underweight or really medically underweight or underweight of any kind to get help, you know? And people need to stop stereotyping people with eating disorders because it's just, it's not on and they just don't make sense because, you know, you're affecting people from getting help. Um, these people already have these stereotypes of themselves. So, you know, when you say they're not sick enough, they have this whole mentality of themselves. Like, okay, well, I'm not sick enough. So, you know, it's not fair that I've not been doing such and such for a said amount of time like that other person and it's like what and you know there's this really bad stereotype that people of, of different minorities or different races don't have eating disorders and you know like mental health eating disorders they don't discriminate and you know when people keep saying oh like only white people have eating disorders like are you like for real like 
don't even get me started like no so and even with the whole stereotype over men can't have eating disorders or men are blah 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 like it's just it's not on like we all need to stop stereotyping people and just you know listen if someone comes to you and says you know like i've been finding this really hard for a said amount of time you should not turn around and say well you don't look like this or you don't do said things so you can't have this it's about being open and you know like encouraging people to get help and that it's okay to get help obviously it's a very hard journey when you have an eating disorder and it can be so scary but it's so so worth it because you get robbed of having a period you get robbed of enjoying food that you usually enjoy you know you like miss out on doing things with your friends because you're in hospital or you know like you can't go out with your friends because you're scared of food or you don't want to like overindulge or things you know um so because i also read that people who are in the lgbt BT community are also more likely to refuse help or be unlikely to receive receive help because especially if they're a gay man there's a lot of misconceptions of gay men they're either really muscular or really thin so you know like they, they can't have any disorder and all these stereotypes have to stop um, I think it's important that people do their research think about what they're saying and how it could affect other people and just be kind you know like there's this whole thing of be kind because you do not know what anyone else is going through and you know you could have friends that look the average like the regular way or whatever but they could have something that's wrong with them and you can't base someone's eating disorder of how they look because that's just not okay you know everyone's journey is valid regardless of what weight they are you know and weight should not be an indication of a proper diagnosis either people should get taken seriously regardless of their weight and regardless of what they look like you know help should be available to all people regardless of their weight um so please if you know someone has an eating disorder or you yourself have an eating disorder please go to any of the links below and you know research try and figure out ways to get support and it does get better um so remember to be kind and remember to not stereotype people who have eating disorders because regardless of what anyone looks like someone you know or yourself could be struggling with an eating disorder and they do not have to be underweight to have one so thank you guys for listening and i'll see you in the next one